going to bring our man of the hour this morning. He is an amazing guy within the community. He's a creator. He's a host. He's very content driven and he's committed to his content. He does it all himself. He's done over a thousand interviews as of last month. Please welcome Quentin Washington. <laughs> oh. oh yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. I thank God in the name of Jesus for this glorious day. Uh, thank you for coming here to hear me speak. Uh, I believe it was Paul Roof who approached me about doing this a couple of months ago uh, via email. And I'm not a public speaker at all, despite the fact that I'm an interviewer and I do one, more than 1,000 interviews. Um, I don't like public speaking. I don't like standing in front of people. And this, it took a lot for me to do this. And, and there was a couple of times when I didn't want to do this, but I felt like, you know what, I have something to say. So I thank you, Paul Roof, and I thank you, Yvonne, for this opportunity. Um, even a couple of days ago, I still didn't know what I wanted to talk about for this particular part of this particular series, Commitment. But it is about commitment. And you know what? I want to go back to my Charleston City paper cover story that was published on August 10th of 2016. I was on the front page of the city paper, still one of my proudest moments of my lifetime. And let me see if I can, there it is. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Oh, let me go back to that. I wanna go to and read this headline, it reads this, and this was written by Dustin Waters, who was a former uh, city paper writer. He says this, the scoop on one of the Holy City's most prolific video journalists, turning the camera on Quentin. Quentin Washington is something of a curiosity in Charleston's journalism community. Over the past four years, he's interviewed media personalities, city and state leaders, activists and artists, but he's not affiliated with any news outlet. Let me stop there. I am Quentin Washington. I'm 33 years old. I'm a native of Charleston, South Carolina, born and raised here, attended public schools. And for many, many years, going back to 1995, I always wanted to be a journalist. And one, one time when I was at, in middle school, I actually went down to the old Channel 5 station, which is a couple of miles from here. And I toured the station with a mentor of mine. And right after that, I told the news director who I ran into, I said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So I wrote him a letter and I said, what can I do? Can I come down and I can enter into the station? What can I do? So they set out a schedule for me. And Monday through Sundays, I would get there, come down to the station. I would get there and write practical scripts. I would listen to scanners. I did teleprompter. I actually learned how to use those big cameras <laughs> in the studio that they still use to this day. And that's how I got my start. That's how I got my love for television news and journalism as a part. And it's been nothing but a good ride from, from 1996 to now. I've had some bumps in the roads of trying to get on television and do what I want to do. But doing interviews, this is what God has called me to do. I can feel it. This is what the Holy Spirit has called me to do. And I love it. I want to finish the rest of this article. It says this, with a small digital camera, no bigger than a deck of playing cards and a flimsy tripod. That's what I had when I first started. I had a flip video camera and a tripod that was donated to me, both of which received the gifts. He's conducted more than 460 one-on-one -on -one interviews and filed almost 7,000 minutes of footage. And of course now it's 1,000 as of last month. Without a working laptop, which I do now have, <laughs> thanks to all of the gifts that I've gotten from this particular article, so I'm able to edit interviews. So I go to Starbucks, and sometimes, I tell you, I don't leave Starbucks until probably 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, and my mom gets mad at me. She's like, well, what are you doing? I'm like, Mom, I'm doing a public service. i got to get it out there. And some people, I, I have to stop there, because some people feel like this is a hobby that I'm doing. It's not a hobby. It's a public service. I'm giving my free time to the community because I have a regular job as well. And this is what God has called me to do. And when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, you got to listen. You just have to listen. And that's what I'm doing. And as I can see the Holy Spirit working because of all of the success that I have with Quentin's close-ups, I mean, look at all the people I've interviewed. I mean, state senators, presidential candidates, everyday people. It's the, it's the grace of God that allowed me to interview these people. It's, and for me, I'm just a regular person, just interviewing them and trying to get their message out, just giving them a platform that normally they don't have. Television, you get 30 second sound bite. Radio, two second sound bites. Newspaper, you get a you know, quote right there. But with me, I give people a chance to speak. And most of the times, for instance, with my interview with Thomas Ravenel back in December, that went on for 45 minutes. <laughs> the last one was almost 50 minutes. But you know, that's Ravenel, he talks, you know. 
And, you know, at the time, I didn't know how that interview was going to come out. But as you can see, unfortunately, he's dealing with some issues right now. And as a, as a forefront, my interviews uh, with him actually have been in the forefront as well as, as headline making news. So you know, the interviews I do have an impact on this community. And I, I, I truly, truly appreciate people watching. And, you know, I thank God for all the people who follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, all of that. I thank you for watching because if it wasn't for you guys, there wouldn't be any Quentin's close-ups. So I thank you for that. Um, let's see if I can move. Oh, I screwed up. <laughs> but I'll, in the meantime, let me just talk about what else he, Dustin wrote. So he says this. Of course, I don't get paid to do this. What time I have outside of my day job, which I do work at Qology restaurant six days a week. So I'm outside getting people in, talking to them about the foods we have, wings, ribs, all that stuff. So in between working at Qology, that's what I do. I do interviews. I mean, I can, you know, normally I would tape interviews at 8 a.m., 8.30, 9 a.m., 10 o'clock, whatever. And then right after work, after I'm done, you know, standing in the heat and whatnot, I go and tape more interviews. So, and, you know, with the process with that, it takes a while because you have to edit most of these things, as you know. And uh, my friend Deja Knight there, it, it takes a lot to edit and actually process that stuff. And it takes a while for it to upload to YouTube. So, you know, it, it takes a lot of dedication, a lot of dedication. And as um, <laughs> Dustin mentioned, and this is what Hard Jacob said about me a couple of years ago to the city paper. He knows things about you you don't even know about yourself. I love research. That's very, very important when you're sitting in front of important people such as Congressman Mark Sanford or State Senator Marlon Kimson or former Mayor Joe Riley, who was my 1,000th interviewee. So, it, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Great. God is great. And you have to do your research because they want to know what you know about them. And, you know, you have to provide that information to the viewers as well. So I, I just love, love <laughs> interviews. And, you know, Dustin went on to say this. Another remarkable thing is how Washington gets to everyone to participate. All the big names sit down for Quentin's close-ups. That's true. I mean, like I mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes a lot of the people in the media, they get mad at me because I get the interviews that they don't. But I've been working at this for a long time. People trust in what I do. And, you know, they're, they do their thing and I do my thing. I'm an interviewer. And they are reporters and anchors. And I try to separate that. I try to articulate that. But you know what? It's been a blessing to interview these people. 1,000 interviewees over the past six years. As a matter of fact, May 24th will be my sixth year doing Quintus close-ups. And my friend here, <laughs> I interviewed her father for the first time for my interview uh, web show Quintus close-ups in 2012, Larry Kabrowski, who's a well-known attorney here in Charleston and the Charleston County Republican Party chairman. To this day, he still can't figure out why I chose him as my first interviewee. But Larry is very impactful in this community, especially these days in politics. So he's in the forefront of that on the Republican side. And, you know, anytime I want to go and do an interview with him about what's going on in politics, he's there. And for some strange reason, he wanted me to be a part of the Black History Month event for the Charleston County Republican Party. And I was one of the honorees. And I still can't figure out why, because I'm just a regular person. I'm just a regular person. I'm not like, you know, the people you see on television or on radio or newspaper. I'm just a regular guy. I never thought about doing interviews. I've always wanted to do journalism, but never anything like this. So when God called me to do this, I was trying to struggle about what to do, how to do it, whether, how many people are going to sit down and do an interview with me, how long I'm going to do, continue to do interviews. But I'm here to the grace of God. You know, six years later, this is amazing. I, I, I just, just love it. Let me tell you about a little bit about me stabbing shots. And Dustin says this, growing up on Charleston's east side, moving from Rackler Street to America Street to Drake Street, Washington got his start in news as a child. He struggled with reading and math early on. He took to looking through newspapers to overcome trouble reading, but Washington still faced other obstacles in and out of the classroom. And I said this, growing up was difficult. I would have people in the streets on the east side who would harass me because of my skin color. Even to this day, people still call me dark or blacky, whatever. At that time, it was, it was difficult. I didn't know how to do with it as a child at 12, 13. So sometimes I would cry. I would run to people and get their advice on how to deal with it. But, you know, back then that was considered, you know, modern day bullying. But I didn't deal with it. I mean, I didn't pay it in mind. I just kept going. I just stayed focused on what God has called me to do. And, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've survived. Nowadays that people talk about that stuff, I understand they're immature. They just don't know who I am. I'm a child of God. And I love this community. And I love the people that I serve. And I'm here to help, and you know, and I want to continue to do what I'm doing, and do it as a public service. 
So, you know, when I see these obstacles or hear about these obstacles, I don't let it get to me. I just focus on what God has called me to do, and I appreciate it. Um, even when I was dealing with the harassment you know, as a child, I took refuge <laughs> at Channel 5. That's how that, all that started. And I was 12 years old back in 1996, and, you know, as I mentioned, I, you know, toured the newsroom, sent a letter to the news director asking him to do an interview with me and allow me to actually work at the station. And I learned a lot about television news that I would normally not learn about when I'm watching on television. I mean, I learned how they gather the stories, how they cover the stories, how they gather their sources. That's a lot. I mean, you know, they start their day sometimes, you know, eight, nine in the morning with morning meetings and they go out throughout the day trying to go cover stories in the field or call people and see if they can get stories about what's going on in the community or get a hold of, you know, Senator Chip Campson about what's going on in the Wando Bridge. That's commitment. That's commitment. And that's what I love about television news. And as I mentioned, I learned a lot there. I still learn a lot there to this day, even when I go and visit most of the television stations when I'm doing interviews. And at the time in my life, things were rough because my mom, who just had back surgery yesterday, she still works at Roper Hospital. And she wouldn't get home until probably 9 to 10 o'clock at night. So we would have to stay with our grandmother, who still lives to this day. She's almost 90. But we would stay with her. And, you know, that, that was tough because I got sleepy sometimes and I would have to babysit my other brothers who were like in their 20s now because I'm 33. But, you know, it was tough because you, you wanted that parent love, but they weren't able to give it to me because they were out working to keep a roof over our heads and allow us to have things that they normally didn't. So, I, I, you know what, I appreciate my mom. I appreciate, you know, what they're doing right now. And I, you know, I encourage anybody, you know, who's out there, just love your parents no matter what, because you just don't know right now what's going on, but eventually you'll get used to it and you'll know why they did what they did. Um, like I mentioned with the newsroom, I saw a lot of things. It was back in 1997, I guess April, right before I left Channel 5, there was a murder at the Pagoda Chinese restaurant right on 17 North. I think there's a Mexican restaurant there now, right before you get to Ananat Boulevard. But the owner, I believe, got killed. And, you know, it, it was difficult to see the coroner being held, his body in the body bag. And when that happened, that changed my life. And I knew right then and there, too, I needed to come out and serve the public and let them know about things that are going on in this community. So that particular incident, that tragedy, is always etched in my mind. That tragedy that happened, because I believe he had kids at the time, and they're probably grown now, and they still don't have their father. Their father's probably in heaven. And, you know, but here on earth, it's, it's just difficult not to have, you know, your parents around to give, you know, give you advice or cheer you on. So, you know, that, that was difficult to see. Um, fast forward to 2009. Uh, I was at Trident Technical College and I've spent probably five years there just trying to get core requirements out the way because I knew I wanted to go to somebody's four-year college. So I was trying to go anywhere I could. I applied to American University, George Washington University. I tried even the University of Richmond because I went to the University of Richmond on a college trip in 2006 and loved it. So while I was at Trident Tech, I was able to, you know, fill out those applications go on college tours, I did my core requirements, and when it was time to move on, I filled out those applications and sent in those, you know, <laughs> you know, those applications, and I really, really wanted to live in D.C., and I really wanted to be a traffic reporter. <laughs> I'm like, traffic reporter, but I was trying to do anything I could to just get out of Charleston, because this was home, and this is all I knew still to this day. So I was trying to figure out, hmm, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? So I applied to those schools. I didn't get into any of them, even the University of Richmond, even though I you know, met with the staff and everything and the missions counselors and all that, just didn't get in because I just didn't have the grades. My grades weren't you know, significant. So what happened was I you know, applied to the College of Charleston in 2009 and they gave me, what was it, conditional you know, admissions. So I was there for like maybe two semesters. And that's when in January 2009, I found out my mother had breast cancer. And also my, my stepfather at the time, he had a stroke. So with the student loans I had, I just, you know, we didn't have anything. So I just took it and paid the rent. At that time, our rent was like probably $800. So I got probably, I don't know, $3,000 in student loans. So I paid that. And I got to pay it back now to this day. But back then it was worth it because family was important and still is important. And I'm happy to stand here right here and here tell you besides the back surgery she just had and she's doing fine. My mother survived breast cancer due to grace of God. She went through chemo radiation. My father, he survived the stroke. He's back to doing construction. But 
hey, family's all you have at the end of the day. And I was grateful to God that I was able to do what I had to do to survive and help them survive as well. It was tough, you know, trying to get a college degree and you're trying to do what you want to do, but at the same time, you have to take a step back and get there and help them out. You know, you don't want to be selfish, but you want to be helpful. So I, that, I, I learned a lesson about that. I was committed. I was committed to helping my family. And, you know, I just thank God they're here. And although I didn't get a college degree, hey, I, I feel like I'm still college educated nonetheless. Uh, I never did become a traffic anchor. <laughs> I could be one today trying to direct traffic out there, especially on the Wando Bridge. <laughs> but um, like I said, for four or five years, I grappled with what I wanted to do in television news. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, at one point, I wanted to be an anchor. At one point, I wanted to be a reporter. At one point, like I indicated, I wanted to be a traffic anchor. But I'm blessed by God to do what I'm doing now because I love doing this. I could never dream that I would be doing something like this. But this is my dream. This is what I'm supposed to do. And I, I, I am so, 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 so happy about doing this. So Quentin's close-ups. It's one-on-one -on -one interviews with newsmakers across Charleston. And what I do is I put my interviews up on YouTube. I have a free Quentin's close-ups app if you want to download that in Apple or Google Play stores. I have the iHeart podcast. Thanks to Kelly Gold and the folks at 94.3 WSC for reaching out to me. And of course, the website's coming along soon. So go there, see my interviews. Like I said, 1,000 interviews is a lot. <laughs> but I, and, and let me tell you about that. I tape maybe three or four interviews a week. Sometimes it depends on breaking news. It could be three or four or even seven interviews. I know this week I did five. I'll be doing two more this weekend. Patrick Bell, who's running for Register of Deeds, and um, obviously State Representative Marvin Van Darvis. So I'll talk to him about the legislative session that just wrapped up. But I, I have fun. I mean, when I do these interviews, I learn myself. I learn a lot of things about these interviews than most of my viewers. But it's, it's so fun. It's, it's just so much fun. I cannot believe I'm doing something like this. It's impactful to this community. And I don't just call my, consider myself or even call myself powerful. I'm not. God is powerful. Jesus Christ is powerful. I'm just a man. I'm a man of God. So, I, I, you know, I'm happy. And, you know, moving forward, I'm going to continue to do what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. I'm going to continue to serve this community. I don't have much. But, you know, the interviews, that's what I want to do. That's all I can give to you. <laughs> but in this particular clip, you'll see my interview, my 1,000 interview with Mayor Joe Riley. Uh, Stephanie Ganaway Paisley, who's running for probate judge for Charleston County, and of course, David Ayler and Mark Pepper. And the audio should be coming up soon, but hey, we'll work on that as well. But Joe looks good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. About the progress of the International African American Museum. What update do you want to get from the South Carolina House of Representatives in your mind? Well, the, uh, in the next week when they adopt the budget for this year for the state, that will be included in their funding for the International African American Museum. And I'm very hopeful the Senate and their version of the budget uh, appropriated $5 million. Uh, the House uh, has not appropriated money into four, but we expect that they will this year. Well, let me jump into the obvious. And I know that you are actually going to be Charles Kennedy probate judge. And I know for 12 years, you served in the Charleston County Circuit Court as a judge. Yeah. Who got you from being a Circuit Court judge to now saying, hey, I want to be a probate court judge? Well, actually, I officially retired in 2016 after serving um, on the Circuit Court bench for over 12 years. Um, it was an honor and a pleasure to serve the citizens of Charleston County for that amount of time. After much prayer and much encouragement, from supporters and family. I decided to run for Charleston County Probate Court Judge. My desire is to help and serve the citizens of Charleston County uh, in the probate court by way of better caring for the wills and probating the estate of the uh, descendants. Parents of abuse, EB Elton Elementary School students, called on Charleston County School Board to immediately fire teacher and principal. And you said this quote, quote, the result of the our investigation has revealed instances of multiple students being physically abused as a routine form of discipline by a second grade teacher 
and E.B. Elgin Elementary School, including but not limited to pencils being thrown at students and their mouths being taped shut. My question is this, where are you emotionally with this information? It's makes you sad. It's probably the first feeling you have because you feel sad for these uh, students and of course their families are having to go through this. And one thing that we talked a lot about uh, when we first were apprised of the situation is how long has this been going on? So there's a clip of it right there, Quentin's close-ups, which you can see every day, uh, anytime you want, 24 hours a day, like I said, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, whatever, it's there. Um, but since Quentin's Close Ups was debuted in 2012, six years now, I've gotten it's so many, oh gosh, it's, it's just the blessing of God. But of course, like I said, I've been on the front page of the city paper in 2016, and I've gotten a house resolution for the South Carolina House of Representatives. That's huge. Nobody's ever gotten something like that in the media, from my understanding. So it, it speaks to the volumes of people who are listening to what I'm saying and how impactful these interviews are. I just had somebody who I interviewed for my web show just recently got mad at me about something and he basically said, hey, your interviews are bubblegum. Well, I'm here to say my interviews are very impactful. Um, listen, I've, got, I've interviewed Republicans, I've interviewed independents, I've interviewed Democrats. People love the way I do my interviews because I don't take sides. I let people tell their story. And I don't want to inject my opinion, I shouldn't, as a journalist, and that's the way I want it to be. Uh, you know, there's cable news and all that, for, all that for stuff. I want to do what I'm supposed to be doing for Quentin's close-ups. So I'm happy to be there doing this, and I hope to do this forever. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Uh, you a sure, that's fine. All right. And, uh, do you want to do any plugs for all your stuff here? Oh, yeah, you again. Already, you already said a little something yeah. about that. Yeah. YouTube, I'm Quentin Washington. You, of course, I mentioned this, but you can download the free app in your Apple or Google Play stores. And, of course, on Facebook, Quentin's Close Ups. I'm, my personal page is maxed up, 5,000 friends, so you can't friend me. <laughs> That's true. But Twitter, Quentin on camera. Love Twitter much better. And, of course, Instagram, some of you guys have it, Quentin Exclusive. So it's right there. But um, I'm open to any questions if you have any. We can still be your friend after today, though, right? Exactly right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, does anybody have a question for you? Oh, Sarah. Oh, go, 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 Ken. Who is your dream interviewee? Jenny Sanford. I've been trying for years and years and years and years of nothing. <laughs> She's giving me like two no's. Oh, and uh, Charlie Condon. I've been trying to get him as well. And uh, John Darby with the uh, Beach Company as well, so... Prayfully, in the name of Jesus, I'll be able to interview them soon. And I hope, I'm hoping to interview Templeton, too, since I've interviewed most of the gubernatorial candidates. Oh, go ahead for it. Oh, did you ever have an interview that went totally different than you thought it would? You had prepared and then... Oh, yes. Oh, Just, any, any interviews that went differently than you Yeah, Wednesday were. afternoon. Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> it was, uh, I don't know if you know him, but he's State Senator John Scott. He's Marjorie Willis's running mate. So, you know, they called me up at the last minute around 10 a.m. I was, matter of fact, I was getting done with Yvonne at the Starbucks. And right after that, they sent me a text message. And they was like, hey, you know, Senator John Scott's in town. You want to do an interview? And I'm like, yeah. But I was like exhausted because I already did an interview with James Smith, who's running for governor at nine in the morning. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So through the grace of God, the Holy Spirit allowed me to put my questions from my mind onto the desktop. So I wrote out my questions. And so we showed up at the College of Charleston Addlestone Library on the third floor. And here comes John Scott. And I've got the camera and the lights and everything set up. So I'm sitting down, I'm getting ready to prepare my questions. And I'm like, hey, Mr. Scott, you know, I understand you guys did a great job last night from the gubernatorial debate you had at the Stern Center. And he just went on and on and on and on and on and on. But, all of his, but you know, ultimately it was like a 12 minute interview, but none of my questions were asked. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like, okay, fine. I said, you know, thank you for answering all my questions at the end of the interview. And we kind of laughed it off, but it's up on YouTube and the app right now. So. If you want to look at that interesting interview, <laughs> go for it. And again, it's all about, hey, it's all about, you know, giving people a chance to speak. And, you know, I'm just taking a back seat. I'm just listening. My job is just to listen, not interject or, you know, obviously inject my opinion as well. Any more questions? Any more questions for you? Oh, there we go. <clears throat> this is sort of a two-part question, but you mentioned how it's, like, it's important you to research yes. who you're going to interview. Yeah. 
Um, what's the process for how you design the questions that you're going to ask, like how you decide on which questions you're going to ask, and also how important is it to you to like stick to those questions and also kind of just vibe out the interview and like do you like stick straight to the questions you ask or does it change depending on how the interview is going? Oh, I just, you know, with the research, I just, you know, go from what I see and I just develop my questions from there, you know, that's, <laughs> I don't have any secret to that or a formula. You know, for uh, but that, but you know, sometimes, like I indicated with the John Scott interview, we just went to the, that went way left. <laughs> so it was just like you just gotta sit there and just listen, and then you can develop questions like that, you know. But most of the times, I stick to the questions. Sometimes I'll ad lib, come up with questions in my mind, and go from there. But I don't have a secret formula. It's just you know whatever I have to do, you know. Your research is all on the internet. Exactly right. Yeah, you, these days you have to. When I first started, I could always go back to the Postal Quarry archives and still look at things from. Years ago, 96, 98, 99, you can't do it anymore because you got to pay and all that stuff, but I still do my research nonetheless, I get it done because I, that's very important, very important. Facts and facts means a lot these days, you know. Um, I, I'll, I'll take a one without the difficulty, I'll get to you. Um, what's the most inspiring one you've had? Can you tell us a little bit about that? I know that's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah, because like I said, you know, all of the interviews I do are very educational in my mind, too. Inspirational, gosh. Um, huh. That's, that's a good one. I mean, like I said, 1,000 interviews, I got to think back here. Um, or even just favorite. You know what? My interview for presidential candidate John Kasich. Oh. So he came to town right after New Hampshire primary on a Wednesday afternoon. And the guy is a completely funny guy. I mean, he knows his stuff. He's very astute and just articulate. And that inspired me. Because, I mean, I've said to myself, hey, if I can interview a presidential candidate, I can interview anybody. So that, that was very inspirational, interviewing a presidential candidate. That, was, that right there is like one of the highlights of my you know, career as, doing it as an interviewer. Okay. Do you monetize your YouTube videos? Yeah, I, <laughs> I need to work on that, actually. I don't. Um, I'm trying to see if I can go the old school route about that and just try to ask people for sponsorships. You know, I just don't know how to go about it because I'm not an advertising guy. I'm just doing interviews. That's it. Um, frankly, I can get that done soon. And then, of course, with the app, I have more opportunities with that versus monetizing on YouTube. So I'm looking at the app route, and then when I develop or roll out the website, I'll be able to do that as well. Yes, of course. Come at you, D. Okay. This is the last one. Sure, they'll go for you. Got, I got plenty of time. Uh, and I never get tired of asking this question. Okay. Some of you are very familiar. But you just mentioned a little bit on YouTube. But what's something that we as a group can do to help? Um, <laughs> I don't know. No tough questions today, Quentin. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> hey, I was supposed to be asking the questions there. Okay, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? It, Sponsorship would be great, so I can you know be able to travel to Columbia, Greenville, and you know interview these people who come to Charleston just for me. So I, that's another thing I thank God for too, for those people coming here to me to interview me versus them, me going to them. So if I can help, this, if anybody wants to help sponsor Quintus close ups, that's all I need for right now. I mean everything is perfectly in place because you know like I indicated uh, with the city paper article, I failed to mention this, but right after that, everyone in Charleston developed a GoFundMe account. And they donated lots of money to my account as far as getting me upgrades for Quintus Close Ups because I was with a flip video camera. <laughs> and that audio was, it's okay. You know, I could only do it inside, outside. It, it was just bad, very bad, very unprofessional. <laughs> but through the grace of God, I got the help that I needed to do the people of Charleston. I thanked them for that. So, you know, I got the laptop, something right there, and I had the tripod, uh, what else? USB cords, camera, of course. Uh, it's so much stuff they gave me. I just thank God to this day for that. But for right now, sponsorships. If you know of anybody who wants to sponsor Quintus Close Ups, reach out to me. You know, do these particular uh, apps here or little social media platforms, and I'll be willing to talk to you. What about uh, connections with news networks? Getting in there, anybody? Um, you know what? You know, it's always been a goal of mine since probably two years ago when I went up to Columbia for Nikki Haley's inauguration. But Columbia is where I want to live. I want to live right there in downtown Columbia on Main Street. So if I can work for ETV or WIS or one of the stations there, that'll be great. Whatever, whatever happens next, it's up to God. God is guiding me. I'm not going to step out unless he steps in. 
And uh, I noticed you have amazing faces when you're interviewing. Do they, do they teach you that? No. <laughs> or you learn that? Yourself. I, well, I, I, you know, it, it all came through, you know, by myself. I'm just laser focused, as you can tell. Yeah, it's tough sometimes because obviously you don't want to get there and inject your opinion or make some sort of expression or try to make it seem like you're in favor of this person, that person. No, I'm not. I actually don't like politics. So, um, you know, when I'm at home, I just try to tune it out all together. I try to go watch VH1 or Bravo or whatever I have to do to avoid it. Because you get a lot of that on social media. You know, you, you go scroll through your Facebook timeline. That's all they see is politics. And I'm like, I'm over it. You know what I mean? So I, I don't like politics at all. So I think that's why Quentin Close Up works because I give people a platform to talk and I don't inject my opinion because I don't like politics. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. We have time for one more question if anyone. Right, any, please bring it. We have one. Um, so going with the um, other question, so your goal is to um, maybe take your career to Columbia right. and um, I'm sure you enjoy the um, you know, having your own type of business and being right. creative and having your platform. Sure. Do you find that if you do get with a network, it would kind of confine you to their kind of rules and regulations? And would you be willing to be confined in some ways that you are currently are not? Well, I always, you know, I'm always thinking about that. And, you know, I feel like with, with my doing it on my own, too, <laughs> uh, it's it has its challenges because I feel like if I'm working at Channel 5 or Channel 2, I can get more access or get more people to say yes. But like I said, through the grace of God, I get them all the time. You know, I get them no matter what because God has favored me. So, you know, whenever that opportunity comes, I'm sure God will favor me, too. And, you know, maybe I'll be able to, you know, come in and do some sort of, you know, half and half partnership where I get some role in it and they get some role in it. I have some say in it and who I can do interviews with and we'll move from there. Oh, go for it. One more. Oh yeah, anytime. I don't have to be working till 11. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you have a favorite interview question. Just it's always described to me the following in one word. Always described to me the following in one word. And I do that because I want to condense the interviews and not make them so long. Like I indicated, Thomas Ravenel was 45 minutes. I think my interview with uh, Papa Smurf, who was a community activist, that was 55 minutes. So it takes a while to sit down and edit that and process it and get it up on YouTube. It takes an hour or two sometimes. But um, describe to me the following one word because I get to condense the answers and, you know, it speeds up the uh, interview or expedite the interview, I say. Thanks. Any more questions? Um, any final thoughts from you before we go? Oh, you know, like I said, just please, please, if you have a chance, just download the app. Quentin's Close Ups, Apple, Google Play Store. I'm on YouTube. You know, share my interviews, you know, and um, don't be afraid to do it. And please continue to support this because this, I'm supporting it as a public service, free time. I don't get paid to do this. My money comes from <laughs> CHG Qology, so I, but what I'm doing is just a public service for the community. And I love this community. This is my hometown, and I hope to stay here as long as I can to serve you guys. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.